Okay, so um, maybe I should already begin. So today, I, first of all, I'd like to thank very much the local organizers for the invitation to present here today. And yeah, I hope you can learn something about me on imaging from this presentation today. So I'll begin by introducing you to a very tiny but very useful visitor which we have from outer space. And we call this little guy the muon. So here we have a cuddly representation of the muon. But don't worry, it's not an alien. I'll now explain to you a little bit about what it is in fact. So you may remember from your high school studies something about electrons. So these are tiny fundamental particles which flow to produce electricity. Well, muons are kind of the same. They're also very small, indivisible particles, also singly charged particles, but significantly heavier than the electron, around 207 times, in fact. And this property of the muon makes them particularly useful. Why? We'll find out a little bit later in the presentation. In some ways, it's not completely correct to say that the muon itself comes from outer space. They're actually created in our atmosphere when an another particle, the proton, are accelerated to high energies by ma strong magnetic fields present in our universe. And these magnetic fields are generated by some of the more exotic constituents of the universe, for example, black holes, supernova remnants, pulsars, and this kind of thing. Eventually, over time, some of these very high energy protons make their way to Earth, and they crash into our atmosphere and produce showers of debris, which we call secondary cosmic rays. Most of these particles which are produced are not stable and live only very short lives. And this is, in fact, true of the parent particle of the muon, which we call the pion. After only a small fraction of a second, the pion breaks down into other constituent particles, one of which is the muon, and one of which is our little um, muon antineutrino here. The neutrino, we can think of basically as a ghost. They rarely interact and can pass through the whole Earth, basically, without being disturbed. But thankfully for us, this is not the case for the muon. And by the time we journey through our atmosphere and reach the sea level, we're left with the muon with the highest detectable number. Uh, muons are all around us. They're passing through us right now. So if we stand here, we put out the palm of our hand, we have roughly one muon passing through every second. But then this doesn't answer the question of why these are interesting and why we want to actually use these particles or how we can use the particles. And to answer this question, we instead now need to look towards the domain of non-destructive testing. And this is basically the methodology which we use to try to look inside of closed volumes without um, this damaging and without disturbing the, the contents in any way. So we want to not open something and have a look inside. Um, traditionally, muons are not used for this technique. This is why we have this presentation today. Instead, um, I focus on a couple of other particles which are generally used for this, photons or electrons. So let's have a look a little bit closer at these kind of particles. So electrons we already learned about. They're um, like a muon, but much less massive, much, have much less energy. And what this means is while well, electrons are very nice probes for very, very tiny things, such as microelectronics or something like that, or you can image, for example, the, the, very, um, the surface of an object, they do not penetrate any way through the material, so they're no use when we want to look for a large object, for example, a shipping container. We look towards the photons, basically particles of light. And these are, for example, X-rays or gamma rays, which probably most of you have heard of already. These are high energy um, particles of light. Gamma rays, very high energy. X-rays, also quite high energy. And they're very damaging particles to life and also need to be generated artificially. Whilst these particles can pass through significantly more of a material than something like an electron, they're still generally absorbed before they reach the other side. What this means is then the images that you get from these kind of particles are two-dimensional. I think we've all been to the doctor, seen an x-ray where you have basically a, a shadow-like image, black and white shadow-like image in two dimensions. And this is the same is true if you try to, for example, image a, um, a shipping container. Now we look to a muon. Muons, we know, much higher energy, much higher, energy, much higher mass than a, an electron can pass all the way through our material without being absorbed. This allows us to probe the whole volume of the material instead. We also have muons coming from our atmosphere. They arrive from all different directions. And this data coming from all different angles allows us to build a naturally three-dimensional picture of our volume. We don't have just a two-dimensional flat surface. We have images, a full three-dimensional representation of our scene. Also, muons are natural, they're ambient, they're completely safe, as we know we have them passing through us now, so they cause no damage. 
But is there any other reason that we might want to use muons? Any other um, interesting features which allow us to gain some additional information through their use? And to answer this question, we need to now look at what happens when the muon interacts with the material itself. Muons, we know, charged particles. And when they pass through a material, they undergo the Coulomb interaction due to other charges present in the material. So you have protons, you have, in, you have a positive charged nucleus, you have your electrons, you have charges present in your material. And this causes small deflections of the muon as it passes through the material. So the path of the muon changes gradually. And this deflection is proportional then to the density of the material through which it's passing. So if you have a low density material, for example, like water, you have only a small change in the path of the muon. If you have a very dense material, such as gold, such as lead, something like that, you have a much larger path deflection of the muon. And this is very good, and it's a very unique feature of muon imaging, which allows us to provide material discrimination based on the density or the atomic mass of the material, which is not possible with other techniques. But now we know what we want to look for, what we want to measure, but now we need to understand how we can do this practically, right? And for this, we need detectors. We need to be able to measure, we need to be able to characterize what is going on with these muons. Here, you see on the diagram, we have our detectors above and below the region that we want to image inside of. We have generally three layers, and I'll tell you a little bit more about why that is later. These detectors, the muon passes through, and we use generally a material called scintillation material. What that means is when the, the muon passes through this, a little flash of light is emitted, which is then converted to a pulse, which can then be analyzed later by electronics. We have in these detector layers a measurement from two different dimensions, and then obviously we know precisely where the muon, where the muon detector is, so we have a full characterization of where the muon passes through this layer in, in three planes. When we have these flashes of light and the pulses, we can analyze them. And basically, with, this is why we then have three measurements, because then we can draw a straight line through them and understand fully the path incoming and the path outgoing of the muon. And from this, we can calculate the angle, the difference between these two lines, and see then how much deflection of the muon has occurred, which is then proportional to the density or the contents in between. This is nice, okay, we understand what happens with one muon, but how do we gain information when we want to analyze a full volume, for example, like a shipping container? Clearly, the analysis of one muon alone is not enough. And for this, we need to look for, we need to yeah, have, a, have a lot more statistics, basically. Each muon interaction is also quite unique in the path that it, it, got, it travels through a material. It's probabilistic, and so we need to take a large sample of muons to be able to understand, on average, how they behave in the material. So if we want to scan a small object, maybe something like a parcel, we would need to collect of the order of minutes of data to have enough statistics to get a good resolution of for your image. If we want to image something much larger, like a shipping container, we need to take wait roughly an hour to collect the statistics that we need for a good image. Um, yeah. So now we have our data. We have our, um, have our tracks for all of our, well, at this point, millions of muons. What we need to do now um, is understand, given our incoming and outcoming measurements, what has happened inside to create these observations. So we basically have an inverse problem. We know what we have coming in, we know what we have coming out, and we want to understand what happened inside to create that. To do this, we first of all segment our scene into small regions, which you can see represented by these squares here. This is shown in two dimensions, but this is actually a three-dimensional problem. Um, we have these small regions, which we call voxels. Then what we need to do is perform reconstruction or apply a reconstruction algorithm. And the development of reconstruction algorithms for muon imaging is a very active area of research and something that we also work on personally. But for today, I'll go through one of the more simple um, mechanisms which are used, which nevertheless can give quite nice results. So what we do is we have the path of the muon coming in, we, bring, we, we propagate this forward, and we have the path of the muon coming out, which we propagate backwards. We find the point in three-dimensional space at which these two paths come the closest to one another. And then we choose which voxel or which small region in space this corresponds to, and then we assign all of this path deflection to have occurred at that singular point. When we analyze this and do this for many, many muons, in this case, many millions of muons, what we do is we build up a picture of where most of this path deflection or where most of this scattering has occurred in your volume. And this then is directly related to the material density. So what you basically build up is a density map or a density profile 
of your volume. We can then apply artificial intelligence methodologies to then segment this, to characterize this, and to understand properly what materials you have, um, also with respect to the rest of the volume. Okay, so I hope that principle is now clear. So we have all of the information that we need, so maybe we can have a little go at trying to interpret one of these maps ourselves, yeah? So here, this is some data which we generated. Um, here is our density map, so going from low density in blue, high density in yellow, and we have an um, object imaged from above, from the front and from the side. So maybe somebody from the audience would like to have a guess at what this object is, someone brave enough. A ship, nice. Okay, very good. <laughs> we guessed correctly. And now we have one more. The same thing again. Maybe a little bit more tricky, this one, from the both, from the front, from the side. Anyone like to have a guess? And it's not a violin. <laughs> okay, we have no guesses for this one. Maybe it's a bit too abstract, but what we have is a dinosaur. <laughs> Which is maybe not um, yeah, accurate for within a shipping container, but there we go. Okay, so now we see also how our data looks. I'd like to spend my last few minutes to um, show you basically a real application of this, because everything that we've seen so far is very theoretical, right? And what I want to show you here is that this is not only a theoretical technique, this is a real technology which has been constructed and proven also in a realistic environment. And we did this as part of the Silent Border project, which was a Horizon 2020 funded project with 10 different partners spread across eight countries. We had four years for this um, and a budget around 7 million euros. The aim of the project was then to construct a real prototype muon scanner for customs and border guards. And here you see a very nice video representation of what we wanted to create within the project. So here are some images of what was built. So we see here on the left some detection technology. So this is our muon detector. We have three layers, as you saw before. These planes here contain lots of small fibers of scintillating material, which are then read out by this electronics here. We see these detectors, which are then um, in each of these small white boxes here, actually quite large white boxes. They're installed on a steel frame, also some underneath this um, pathway, um, around a shipping container in order to take um, measurements. So this was demonstrated in Estonia. Here we showed in a demonstration um, this scenario, um, which we derived in collaboration with customs authorities. But we see our wa two water tanks here, one of which contains some contraband material, which we wanted to detect. This um, scene was selected because it can be particularly tricky for x-rays, given the large amount of water present in the scene. And what we see when we take data here might be a little bit difficult to interpret, but what I want the takeaway here to be is that this is from real muon data. So this is not simulation, this is real data, which we took. And you can see here a reconstruction, as we described before. And you see most of the features present in the photograph are clearly reconstructed here in this, um, this muon reconstruction. Also here you see in red, um, after the application of artificial intelligence methodologies to try to characterize this scene, you see then our contraband material clearly detected. And again here, this is the result of another artificial intelligence methodology to look for anomalous um, regions in our data. And we see again here where these crosses are, again, the contraband clearly detected over the background of the rest of the scene. So what this aims to show you here is that this concept works. This is a real technology which has been proven in a real operational scenario. And this is not the only application area for muon imaging. We also have um, many other active areas of ongoing research, also commercial applications of muon te technology now. For example, for um, archaeological purposes, for example, um, measuring pyramids, also, for example, um, industrial monitoring or also then characterization of nuclear waste, amongst other things. But I want to finish on here is a little bit of an outlook for the future of the technology, which here, from this slightly abstract image here, we see um, the possibility to begin to generate artificial muon beams using lasers. So what we can do is now create tiny little particle accelerators using lasers, which allow um, electrons to be accelerated to very high energies. We can put these electrons into a target, which then can generate a large beam of muons. And you have here 
Um, the number of muons around 10,000 times what you might expect from ambient radiation. What this allows then basically is a, to open a, a many new doors for the domain of muon imaging, for example, in the medical domain. And then you reduce really your scan time from the order of minutes to the order of seconds and improve significantly also your resolution. So really this technology has a long way to go and still a lot more avenues to be explored. So yeah, many thanks. Um, feel free to ask any questions or to contact me.